Hello and welcome to the Capital Conversation with me, Michael Heyman. On today's programme, we have a campaigner, innovator and entrepreneur who's focused on tackling one of the world's greatest ever challenges. Because according to the United Nations, up to 43 million people have died worldwide as a result of HIV and AIDS-related illnesses since 1981. But my guest today, Bridget Bard, is on a mission to help create the first AIDS-free generation with her business, Bioshore. Now, to tell us more, welcome to the show, Bridget. And, and um, tell us a bit about the business. Extraordinary business. Loved reading about it. Yeah, it has. A genuine it's, mission. <laughs> it really really has. So um, Bioshore is a UK diagnostics company and we developed and launched the first approved HIV self-test that uses blood. So um, that was back in 2015. Now. Right. So, so frame the, the test. The test is... You, you can buy it in Boots, right? Yeah, in, in, we're in the UK, we're in Boots and Superdrug. Uh, we sell on Amazon and online. But fundamentally, the, the principal technology is the same as a pregnancy test. So we didn't um, discover self-testing. All of that was done kind of 30 years ago. But now it's a finger prick test uh, that we've got incredibly accurate. It's the tiniest drop of blood. Um, and it gives you your own easy-to-read result in 15 minutes. So, mm. Mm. I mean, you're you're campaigning for an age free generation. I mean, when, I, when you go back to the early 80s, I mean, I, I, mean, I, I was a teenager then, and I, I can remember, I mean, this was, this was something that people were, it, it was it, the fear, the dread, the, the sense of impending doom about AIDS that actually wasn't something that we could, we could get hold of or, or control. In terms of, in terms of what's happened since, in terms of the role of science and medicine, I guess what, what has paved the way for you? Give us a sense of that journey in terms of actually how modern medicine has started mm. to get on top of the issue. Well, that, that's the really significant change. So you talk about the early 80s, which is everyone remembers the tombstone adverts, and there really was a very serious public health threat at that point. There was not very good treatment for HIV. Um, it, it was a death sentence. Um, really what's happened in the interim of that is that antiretroviral treatments have become incredibly um, accurate and really simple now. So the, the cocktail that you used to remember is now very often a one tablet a day regime. Mm. And so you can live a normal life now? Normal life expectancy. There's incredible data that someone living with HIV and on successful treatment might actually live longer but the big thing is that when you're on that treatment, not only, um, so the virus becomes suppressed so that it's undetectable. So your own health's protected, you have a normal life expectancy, but you can't pass it on. Mm. And that's the biggie. But I guess with all of the advantages and, and the advances in terms of the what, what medicine's been able to do is, I guess the mis the, uh, the misapprehension that actually this is this is an issue that's been been solved. I mean, that actually, this is still a major um, condition. There are major challenges, um, I guess, surrounding it in terms of, I guess, the public appreciation of of HIV and AIDS as a as an issue. Do we still get it? Do we still have the sense of 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 jeopardy? I guess in all of this. Well, it's I think. Primarily because it's it's transmitted the the primary uh, transmission route is sex. So if people find it very hard to talk about it, think about it. There's loads of stigma that surrounds it. But the the driving the real reason that we still have transmissions is that people don't know their status. Mm. So if people do test and do know their status, they're on treatment and then transmission stops. So. All of our messaging and education is don't be afraid of not knowing, your, you know, of, you're so much better off to know because then you're in control. And, and in terms of what you found as a business in terms of overcoming that stigma, is there, a, is there a personal stigma about I don't even want to go and know, I don't even want to take the test? I mean, how do you, how do, how do you create public awareness, public acceptance, I guess, actually buy-in that this is the thing to do? Uh, there definitely is um, a fear inside and, and we always kind of pull everything back to pregnancy testing because people understand that and it's established. Um, quite often people feel guilty or they're upset with themselves, they've done something they wish they hadn't done and then taking that ownership of testing um, is a really significant mm. emotional journey. But I guess if you test positive, I mean, I mean you know, you've got a, you've got a, a test um, that you're doing, you're not, you're not doing it in a surgery or a hospital, you're, you're doing this potentially at home. Mm. I, mean, I mean, in terms of actually the support that goes with that, in terms of what's required to actually help people through that, that, that process, I mean, is there, a, 
Is, is there a tried and tested way now in terms of how support works, in terms of what goes on beyond the test? Yeah, I mean, when we launched as a, a world first, there was this scepticism about not only would people want to self-test, but could they self-refer into care? So global algorithm is if you have an, a positive HIV test, even in a laboratory, you have to have it confirmatory tested. So we've worked with really big stakeholders. We did a very large um, pilot with the Terence Higgins Trust looking if people would self-refer into care. And pretty much everyone does on their own time frame but the thing is once you've done a test and you know even if you want to throw it in the bin ignore it and i've heard this from numerous people you know mm. and human instinct is to survive and only so things, not knowledge is power it absolutely is and we work whichever country we're operating in we work with local health systems we work with local stakeholders so there is we're we're really passionate about how we signpost people but you've also talked a lot about role modeling and and the rugby player gareth thomas yeah. is somebody that you've met somebody that has inspired you in normalizing the conversation i mean uh, oh, pick out the story for us <laughs> <You got, yeah. laughs> as you said that i was really fortunate to meet him um recently and he is an incredible guy um Remind us of his story. Well, he's um, an ex-rugby player. Um, he played for the British Lions. You don't get any higher than that. And um, he was basically forced to come out about his HIV status, which just is wrong. And the story that he gave was so honest and he was so hounded by the press. It was a, obviously, it's his status. It's his, um, his thing to own. But the day that he released his news, he did an Ironman. And you can't get any better mm. than that. You know, I can't imagine being able to do an Ironman. And he is really driving the conversation through rugby channels, through news channels. Um, he's normalising it. He's showing that you can live very healthily with HIV. Be yourself. Um, and it is inspirational, his story. Mm. Tell us a bit about, about what's driving the business. I mean, is it, is it just about testing or is it about cure? Well, we're not involved on the treatment side of things at all, but the, the route to ending, so the, creating the first AIDS-free generation is about getting people diagnosed. And there are reasons people don't access clinical, traditional clinical testing. Um, so we offer another choice. We're not there to replace that, but it could be geographical challenges, self-stigmatisation. Mm. Um, so this, if we get people testing and get them on treatment, then game one. But a million AIDS deaths in 2017 mm. i mean i mean in terms of in terms of actually addressing mortality i mean which way are the figures going now well the the, the um, actual infection is moving into different age groups i'm talking on global level now it's almost 68% of new transmissions are in women and especially young women but they're being diagnosed because they get pregnant and have to engage with healthcare and now pretty much all pregnant women are screened for hiv men are not testing. It's asymptomatic. Clinics are a problem to get to during working hours. So the target now is getting men testing and diagnosed as part of a routine mm. health kind of program. And, and do you get a sense? I mean, you've got, you've got by the sounds of it, a great product. You've got um, a proven, um, a proven technique. Um, but in terms of actually the the market's response, the consumer response, it, it, it sort of sounds like you've still got a, a mountain to climb in terms of not only awareness but also acceptance that that this is the way to go. This is this is this is the way to take control. I mean, what what's the trigger <laughs> that that gets you to yeah. mass awareness? I guess. Yeah, it's, it's hard, and we use digital media a huge amount, social media influencers, um, because as you say, it's not only the awareness that did you know you can test yourself and get your own result and own the result um but just yeah it's such a big task plus the stigma side of things so um but now we're in mainstream channels as you say in retail and in like boots and super drug it does normalize things mm. and people are, are getting into the routine of repeat testing if you live a life that you know puts you at potential exposure, I mean, and you're moving into into other kits: hepatitis B and C, malaria, syphilis. I mean, the list the list goes on to what you're looking at, um, even into um, even into animal diseases, sort of foot and mouth, and um, many other. I mean, so many. It's like a, it's like a, a hit <laughs> list are. of tough diseases and problems. And a isn't lot it? of those are yeah. only in kind of scoping right. um, phase, and um, you know, just looking at them. But Hep C is a very realistic prospect. But presumably. I mean, this is where a business like like yours is is sort of is is going to make its progress. Is addressing the things that we thought were untreatable, uncurable, all those sorts of 
I, I, I guess, taboos that you can address by practical solutions. Yeah, and I've, I've always been adamant that self-testing is the future, and I didn't really know a lot about the global market, but there's a clinical bottleneck, so there's not enough healthcare professionals for population, and we had this real resistance, especially in some places in Africa. You're stealing jobs, and we're really now allowing people to self-screen so that coming through healthcare are people that need treatment and support, not just a screening process of people that are negative. So there's a, there's a really positive shift. I believe everything at some point we'll, you'll be able to diagnose at home or self-screen, let's say. So that's the future. Yeah. Um, when we come <laughs> back after the break, we're going to discuss some of the obstacles because Bridget's definitely not one to shy away from a challenge. Um, and we're going to discuss some of those big hurdles that she's had to jump with Bioshore's journey. We're going to be right back. Welcome back. My guest today is the founder of Bioshore, Bridget Bard. Now, Bridget, before the break, we spoke about the issue and I guess the creation of the business to address it. But mm. um, I was reading here in terms of the approvals you had to gain legally and from government that there have been so many barriers to bringing them to market that if I thought about them all before, Maybe I wouldn't have done it. <laughs> Is it really? I mean, your words, not mine. No, I, mean, I, I recognise them, the actually. Yeah. Um, well, when, uh, we were a world first, so we, we came to market via CE marking. And, so tell us what CE marking is. Uh, but that's to get the European approval. So right. there's user evaluations and laboratory evaluations, but nobody had ever done it before. So we had to work through even, um, through, not only through the UK, but the European Medical Agency. Um, and we're the highest risk device that's ever come to market is HIV and blood and an untrained user. So, so a lot of a lot of initial risk aversion. Absolutely. Um, I mean, how much of that was reasonable, do you think? I think it was all reasonable. I and mean, we were very happy to set the bar as high as we possibly could. But what we've done since then is continue to really accumulate lots and lots of evidence and data proving all the things that everyone was worried about um, haven't actually come to fruition. So not social harms. People were worried that people, you know, go off and commit suicide. And with even with the World Health Organization, that's been proven that that's not the case at all. But regulatory wise, yeah, it's a lot. Right. I mean, and, and do you think the regulators have learned anything through your journey in terms of oh, yeah. young entrepreneurial businesses and what it takes to get because I mean do you, do you count as what a med tech business or uh, yeah we're right. disruptive med tech disruptive actually. med tech <laughs> right okay but I mean in terms of like you know a lot of businesses are in your position you know they've got breakthrough ideas technologies medicines and so on but actually that that journey to approval is, um, is yeah. pretty difficult and especially when you're the one forging the path it has so we, we've shared our protocols with lots of agencies but it, it is true had I been clever enough to know kind of what was ahead I'm not sure I'd have had the had the kind of energy to keep going to go, to go through with it now now um, Public Health England I guess is the the, the, the institution you, you've, you've done a lot with lately in terms of its attitude towards um, self-testing um, and the availability of the kits on the, on the NHS. They've, they've, not yeah, been, well, they've not been overly supportive, have they? No, they haven't. And there's a system that they use called home sampling. So you get a test a little bottle sent to your home and you send it back to a lab. Um, they just won't accept uh, self-testing as part of kind of their funding system. It's also devolved to local authorities, so it's it's complicated. But they know we exist. We share all of our data with them. We're happy always to share our data with mm. people. I mean, I mean, you've described their decision on this as, as, as disgraceful. I mean, do you, do, do you think they understand why? Uh, well, we do talk to them um, quite a lot, and there is a strong HIV prevention um, programme, and I know HIV is not that high on their agenda. There is a committee at the moment that's looking at ways to get us to zero. So hopefully self-testing is back on that table. Mm. We're not part of that committee, I have to say. And, and does it alter around the country? I mean, because obviously health is dealt with differently in Scotland than, than Wales and England. I mean, do, do you find that, and uh, Northern Ireland, do, do you find that 
do you find that actually sort of attitudes shift depending on where you are in yes the UK? yeah very much and and London obviously has a bigger spend anyway so London's far more engaged but we've worked with um, the NHS and the Martin Fisher Foundation with vending machines down in Brighton uh, we've done some fabulous stuff with Public Health Scotland and the Waverley Centre they're much more um, pro change so Scotland's um, more pro change yeah yeah they've been really good um, yeah and much easier to work with now, now much has been made of um, the NHS and the adoption of, of technology I guess not not least because the Secretary of State is an avowed technology fan in terms of actually the practicalities of that in terms of creating a tech friendly NHS what what what, what would you score it at the moment in terms of its adoption rate I think it's a deep sigh. Oh, like, that, that was <laughs> terrible. I didn't mean to make it that deep. Um, it's just so long that the change it ta the changes take so long to implement, and there are reasons behind that. Um, I was told that we're a speedboat and they're a tanker, and we can't just dive in. So and you're out a speedboat, they're a tanker, right? Yeah, okay. Um, but I mean, I don't think they're against technology, but it takes a long time to get into the system. Mm. And, and to, to some degree, the growth of your, the success of your business relies on actually very productive relationships, positive relationships with the regulators. It does, and every country that we go into has very uh, strict regulations. But this is one of the main reasons that we've pushed into the consumer market mm. because we were talking before about um, how we kind of educate and communicate grassroots level. People do want to do this. They do want to own it. They want to be able to buy it, own their result, and do their own test. Do you get the sense that I mean, you're working all over the world with this? I mean, I mean, I mean, how, 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 how? To what degree does the UK get it? To what degree do, do the regulators you're dealing with compared to other countries? I mean, is this a particularly sort of um, poor example of getting no, it? Or, or do they here, get it better than others? Yeah, I think here it's good because there's a policing mechanism. So there were lots of unregulated tests that were already uh, available online when we launched and the MHRA one by one kind of closed them off. Um, in countries like Germany, um, there doesn't seem to be anyone policing it. We have the same situation in South Africa. So some countries, everyone has regulations, but some are good mm. at policing them and others aren't. And the UK is very strict right. on that. So right. it's a good thing to keep the bar high for sure. Now, let's go back to the business because yeah. after listening to you speak, if you tell me you were a scientist, if you were telling me, but actually <laughs> your background, you're a broker, you're an entrepreneur. I mean, you're looking at this very much as, as a business. But what gets you from the world of broking to buy a shore? Oh, my goodness. Well, the, the, the plastic technology that we um, utilise, we didn't invent. And as I say, the opportunity came up and it's like, mm, well, it's like a pregnancy test, but for diseases, that's a no-brainer. I mean, that, that's why. What are you personally <laughs> interested in that? I mean, I get, I get how it works, but I mean, yeah. was, there, was there a kind of light bulb moment? I mean... That makes me sound like a genius, <laughs> which I'm not. But there was... I did think, how can people not get this? And I, I was introduced through... I know lots of people kind of all over the world and through some people that I knew in New York and working with a kind of team of brokers there said, so, you know, you know about this, we need to find someone. It's like, wow, OK, this is really interesting. So you saw this as, first and foremost, this is a market and an opportunity to grow an idea and come up with a solution. But yeah. you made that fundable. You've taken on external funding we have. as part of that. I we mean, have. What's been, the, what's been the journey of the entrepreneur in terms of what you've learned about yourself in scaling the business? Well, we always talk about blood, sweat and tears because it's, <laughs> <laughs> it's literally that. Um, because of the regulatory hurdles and the product development that we go through, there is so much upfront cost. Uh, so funding is a really key part to keep growing mm. it. And now we're expanding into other territories. We're we're sprinting to try and keep up with ourselves. And, and do you need patient investors? I mean, is this is this a kind of is this a business that can can show the required promise quickly, or is this a, or is this something that no, over you the need to have term? a degree of patience because we're having to prove a concept. Mm. Um, nobody even knew that they wanted to self test for HIV, so one by one we're convincing them. But honestly, at grassroots consumer level, we just don't have any resistance. When you say to people, "Do you know about this?" They go, "Oh no, really? Where can I get one?" Like, yeah. can I buy it? You know, it's it's really like that. But in terms of of building a business like this, presumably you've got 
um, a lot of very expensive, clever people in that yeah, business. Yeah, there, there I mean, are some. There are um, some. My clinical director is amazing, and my chairman, who also mentors me, a man called Sir Nigel Knowles. I could not have made this journey without him. He's extraordinary. Mm. I mean, in terms of actually assembling that, from you know, I mean, a lot of people will be listening to this as startup entrepreneurs wanting to scale. In terms of how you assemble that that kind of, I guess, winning squad. What, what, are the, what are the lessons, do you think, in terms of how you've been able to do it? I, I think we're really fortunate because we're in HIV and we have social impact and we, we have tangible social impact. We're making a so difference. So there's a mission, there's a cause. Yeah, a right. cause. And um, so we attract some amazing people who really do support us. Um, and we've always had, or certainly tried to have this vision of creating a a credible brand that everybody trusts that they can self-test with. So the end journey, which is goodness knows how far mm. in the future, has been there since and, the beginning. And does that, I mean, in terms of the, the big goal, the age-free generation, I mean, is there a team of people that work with you that think that that's what mission accomplished means for us? Yeah, everyone in my team truly, truly believes that. And um, we have to work. I mean, we're always on restricted budgets. We're not some super huge multi-billion corporation. So we work with activists. We work with um, influencers. It's all about that messaging, about taking control, mm. own, your, own your status, know your status, be in charge. Um, and, and as a young business that's scaling, when you look at the next chapter, you look at the, I guess, the obstacles and opportunities yeah. ahead. What, what, what sort of... Peaking What's the dream the and what keeps you awake at night? <laughs> Everything keeps me, keeps me awake at night. I think, I think running out of money and running out of time are the two big things. There's not enough hours in the day and we can always do with more money. So um, plugging in to uh, you know, additional distributors now and you know, even going through the legals, the due diligence, the regulatories, everything. It's like, come on, now, mm. now. Um, and, and if presumably you have to find new things about yourself in terms of stamina and perseverance and resilience. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like a roller coaster um, kind of journey, but yes, it is. Um, yeah, dig deep, and we always say, "How do you eat an elephant one bite at a time?" And you have to remind yourself of that sometimes well, when it becomes overwhelming. As a tea time show, I'm, I think eating the elephant one bite at a time <laughs> feels like an appropriate uh, time to leave it. Thanks so much for sharing your story. Oh, thank you for having that's me. That's all we have time for this week, and thanks to my guest Bridget Bard, the former broker breaking all precedent to tackle one of the world's greatest issues, HIV and AIDS. Bioshore is at the forefront of the health tech innovation in the UK and indeed across the world. A founder who's overcome immeasurable challenges to put her solutions to the market. And if you're looking for more inspiration from the entrepreneurs on that front line of change, join me next time on The Capital Conversation. I'll see you then.